evening. I had a long debate with myself about whether I should speak Greek or English, and it was long enough to take five minutes, so here it is, the decision. You figure out why, and I just jump right in. Um, some time ago, I was talking to a colleague of mine from New Zealand, and he was telling me, he's a Brit, and he was telling me how he took his family, and especially because of the kids, they moved to New Zealand, because London is stressful, and it's, it didn't feel that safe, so they went to New Zealand. I mean, New Zealand, I haven't been there. It must be really a beautiful scenery, it, it strikes you as a really calm place, and it, it must be the safest place in the world. And then, oh, what an irony. Two weeks ago, two months ago, sorry, this happens. Somebody goes out and randomly kills all these people. And the world is not a safe place anymore. And my thought goes immediately out to my seven-year-old, and I think, oh my God, you know, this world that I'm bringing my child up, what is it going to be when he's out there traveling or studying or, I don't know, praying, whatever he's going to do. And then my corporate background kicks in. You know, my first job was at McKinsey, and, and when you're in consulting, the how is very important. And then my coaching background kicks in. So immediately I go from there to how. How can we do something different in this world? How can we prevent something like that? And it's a very big question because you know, you have to wonder, this person, I mean, he's a kid like you, he was about 20 years old, and what happened to this guy? How rejected, how sad, how much pain did he have to be in? How lost, how much lost, and how did he lose all this balance and sense of orientation to go out and inflict this kind of pain to people he didn't know, he didn't care about? And how can we, as society, prevent that? So, it's very presumptuous, but I do think I have one of the answers. The answer is never one. So I do think I have one of the answers. And it's going to go against a lot of things we believe, but we're here to switch perspective today, right? So bear with me. Let me take you back a few years in a much more beautiful scenery. So it's the beginning of the summer, and I had just finished a seminar of eight weeks about self-confidence and self-esteem. And there was a fantastic group of people. There were some students, there were some entrepreneurs, there were a couple of doctors, um, executives. And it was the end, and everybody was really hyped up, and we said, let's go celebrate. And we went to the Hilton, and if you haven't been there, I mean, it's beautiful. You go to the rooftop of the Hilton, and it was the sunset, the, the skies were clear, you could see all the way to Piraeus, you could see, you know, this beautiful Parthenon shimmering there in the light. And we were all so happy. I mean, you know, I, I saw this group of people really empowered, and I was really, really excited. And then I look around to just check on each one of them, and then I see this one guy, a doctor, and he had this look like, ooh, I might ask for my money back. You know, and that's never a good thing if somebody in one of your seminars thinks that he might want his money back. So I had to go there, and I said, what's wrong? I mean, didn't it work for you? You know, you don't seem very hyped. And he said, no, 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 I had amazing breakthroughs, and it's been very good, I needed that, really, I needed that. But, you know, I mean, we're here, and three hours every week, for eight consecutive weeks, all we do is about ourselves, all we talk about is ourselves, all we think about is ourselves. It's all about me, 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 me. Isn't that completely selfish? I mean, is that right? And he was actually referring not to something that was wrong in his life, not to the reason why he couldn't absorb and enjoy this beautiful place and moment that we're in. He was just talking about his personal guilt. And I believe that guilt is a global social disorder. I don't know if any psychologist would agree with me, but I do think that is an epidemic. And I spent um, years studying literature, so I'm very good with words, I love words. And I went back to the dictionary and I checked out, you know, all the possible words for selfish. And it's funny, you know, when, whenever you concentrate on yourself and do something for yourself, with yourself, there are a lot of negative connotations. You don't really need to read the list, but I just put it there to illustrate how many words, negative words, we have to illustrate just that. So, if you take time for yourself, or with yourself, or to invest in yourself. You could be anything between, I mean, there are 30 words approximately, anything between egocentric, egomaniac, egotistic, self-serving, self-absorbed, uh, self-centered, vain, and the list goes on. And I looked at the antonym then, and there was just one word, right? Just one word, altruistic. And I thought, ah, oh, okay, I mean, it's great, altruistic is a great word, 
But what happens? This is one extreme and the other extreme. So at the one end, you are allowed to, you know, be with yourself, do whatever it is with yourself, with your, you know, um, with your feelings, your beliefs, whatever, but you, you're at risk of being all these things. And then you have the other extreme, altruistic. And then what's in the middle? And this space in the middle normally is covered by guilt. And I thought, what if we could just take this word out and everything that comes with it and put in there another word, okay, something else. Make it a safe space for people to just sit with themselves and ask the big questions and build character instead of building their image and be something better, a better version and, and strive to being something bigger and better in this world and look for balance. What would that word be that when you use it, it's a good thing, and you're proud of yourself, and you're contributing. You're showing up in a much better way than just now without doing all these things. And again, I'm, I'm a big lover of words, so I analyzed the words, and I went on research, and I spent some time going back to the classics, you know, our classics, our philosophers. I read across different theories, and I came up with this word, esocentrism. And it's not a difficult word to understand if you're Greek, but if you're not a Greek, it's two words, really. Eso for within, looking within, and centrum, the center, because I do believe there is a center of our existence. And the center also has the connotation of balance, you know, because if you want to be in balance, you must be in the center. The two extremes, you're probably going to fall. Now, through all my research, I convinced myself that I was right about one thing that we are fundamentally born good. And we're born with somewhat of a superpower. Somewhere inside us, there is this source, this big energy source, that allows us to be what we are, to do things. And it's amazing because we do amazing things. And if you think about the whole of your life, you, we use words like, he taught me to walk, but actually you walked, you talked, you came here today, you have fallen and stood up and fall in love and got rejected, and then fall in love again, and lost somebody, and felt devastated, and then managed to stand up again once more and move forward and be again the person you're supposed to be. So this force, I think it's this core, this center that I'm referring to when I'm talking about esocentrism. And um, if I want to illustrate it, it would be like we're born in this beautiful oasis and there are palm trees and there's a little bit green and, and there's shade and there's this beautiful you know, well or pond with nice fresh water. And what happens as we grow up, and it's natural, it's only natural, we just drift away. We, we go out on adventures to discover ourselves, to discover the world, to take risks, to try things. And there's only one problem with that, and it's a great idea, but there is one tiny problem with that, that the more we drift away from our own source, we tend to believe that it's not there anymore. We tend to believe that our little pond is dry. So what we do is go to others and seek their approval, seek their pat in the back, belonging, love, whatever it is that we need. We are trying to find it, in somebody else's life, in somebody else's nod, in somebody else's oasis. And that's not a good place to be. That's a very bad habit that we have, looking to others to fulfill something that is already there and is really full and clear, and we all have it inside, and we just lost touch with it. And this is what esocentrism is. Now, this is not a difficult thing to do or to achieve, but it does require one thing, to spend time alone, disconnected, and ask the big questions that normally we leave to philosophers, all these big whys, but it's ours to ask. And you, know, you would think, okay, 10 minutes a day, is it gonna change anything? Yes, it does, yes, it will, and yes, it's very difficult. Back in the 17th century, Blaise Pascal, a French polymath, wrote, all of man's miseries derive from the fact that we're unable to sit in a room quiet and alone. And there is a truth to that. I mean, I don't know what uh, Pascal here would say if he would live here. I mean, we are in a room, it is quiet, we are alone, yet we're so obsessed about checking out what's happening and 
how are we going to project our perfection, our life to everybody else through social media and how we're going to build again our brand and not our character. So it is easier than, said than done. If you look at literature, if you look at our studies, we spend millions and millions, even billions, investing into creating leaders. I mean, I have stood and learned about leadership. I have taught leadership. Any self-respecting uh, company out there, they have leadership academies, leadership uh, initiatives, leadership schools, and that's a great thing. But what is a leader if he cannot lead himself? How great a leader will he be if he has no self-leadership? And self-leadership for me is the new leadership. You know, maybe this whole leadership thing worked at a time, but we're in different times now and things are getting more flat. Hierarchies are getting more flat. So we need people to take you know, responsibility, to take ownership in what they're doing, to find the motivation inside them to not require somebody to tell them exactly what to do, exactly when to do it, and give them a big bravo at the end of the day, but just do it because it feels right, because they're doing their own thing and they're happy. And that's how you get motivated. And then if you have this paradigm for yourself, then you can change others. So if self-leadership is the new leadership, I'm also convinced that esocentrism is the path to self-leadership. Well, talking about, you know, esocentrics, I have to say, I am a big fan of Alain de Botton. If you haven't heard of him, please Google him. It's a fantastic person. I mean, I don't know him, but I had the honor of being interviewed at the same time as him in this newspaper, and I saw the picture. Obviously, we're not in the same room, right? It looks like it, um, but here it is. It looks like it, but we're not in the same room, but... I saw that and I thought, oh my God, fantastic. He is a philosopher. I love his work. This is meant to be, you know, I should Google him and contact him. And I'm sure, I mean, his wife is going to love me. We're going to have fun. We're going to sit down and talk about these big questions. And I go, in the, uh, I go in his site and I go down there to the contact. And he had written something that I don't remember the exact words, uh, but it was something like, um, I have retrieved to my cave because I'm writing a book. So there was no contact number or email or nothing. And I thought, oh my God, he's cool. You know, he's doing his thing. And he doesn't feel bad about it. He's doing his thing and he just goes away and he proclaims to the world that that is okay. Again, I don't know how his wife feels about that, but I thought it was an awesome idea. Awesome. So this idea of spending time building our character and building ourself has taken a bit of a wrong turn, I think, in our society. When we say self-care, you know, you've read the articles, anything that says self-care, it starts with have a massage, have a bubble bath, have a, I don't know, go for a trip, go for a run. These are great things. Big fan of massages, big fan of bubble baths. Can't deny it. Yet, the amount of energy and resources that we spend on our body, undeniably, a great deal. Have we ever compared it with the resources and energy we spend and we invest in our spirit or in our soul? We're going to live, predictions say, until 120. I mean, my son will probably live to be 120. That's a great accomplishment for mankind. Is it? What will his life be if we do not invest in his spirit and in his soul? So this idea of esocentrism is to take care of ourselves. And take care of ourselves means in all levels. To go out there and get inspired every day. To seek people that we admire and we look up to. And, and talk to them or read about them and find out what they're doing, how they're doing it. To looking deep inside of us and finding out what makes our heart tick what it is that makes us wake up in the morning with a big smile, what it is that allows us to feel fulfillment. When is it that we feel that we're okay, that we are worthy of great things, that we are capable of great things, and that we have the right to go out and claim them, and that we have a chance to actually getting them? This is what esocentrism is. 
Now, normally, when I have this discussion about exocentrism, there's always a person there or more that say, great, that's just what society needs, you know? As if we were not individualistic enough, yet another guy or girl or theory that says, yes, be more individualistic. And then we go back to this list of negative words, remember? Because there is not a good word. There is not any word that describes it. So please, remember, esocentrism. So whenever I get this question, everybody for themselves, then the answer is no. No. I believe that when we are good inside, when we are in contact with this source of our superpower and our happiness and you know, our, our ability to do great things and to think about things, I believe that then we are balanced. I believe when we know what our values and our ideals are and we align our actions with that, I think we're okay. I think we're safe. I think we run less risk of grabbing a gun and going out and killing randomly 20 or 40 or 50 people. And I do think that it's up to each and every one of us to contribute to a calm, happy and balanced society. And the way to do that is to start here. Start inside us and be esocentric. So I want to mention another esocentric that I really, really love. You know, um, if you look at books, on, the, on Amazon, you will see there are so many books about the, highly, um, the, the, the habits excuse me, of highly effective people, the habits of millionaire, the habits of this, the habit of that. And they always remind me of this woman and their habits. So, I don't know if you know her. Yes, older people do, younger people don't. And I feel it's my duty to you know, include her in this conversation about esocentrism. This is a, an old lady, she died in 1982. Her name is Despina Akhladioti, and she used to live in this little place back there. And it's so tiny, I mean, that's it. That's all her life, that little place. And just to give you an idea, this is our, kind of our last frontier. You see where it is, this big part there, mainland is Turkey. And the only thing close to Greece is Castellorizo, which is a big island, but not that big. And here is the big picture. You see that red little dot is her island, Ro. And she lived there for about half a century. And for about half a century, she did one thing. She would wake up in the morning, and that was her daily routine, right? She would wake up in the morning, she would raise the flag, our flag, the Greek flag. And then in the evening, she would take it down. And then the other day, you know, and then another day, another day. And I ask, is there a day where you forget to brush? Where you're too tired to take a shower? Where you are too, I don't know, drunk to take your shoes off and you just plunge into your bed? Well, she didn't miss a day. She never missed a day. And this is the power that only when you're aligned with what you think what you believe is important to you, what you really, really want to, to put out there, and the legacy you want to leave. This is the kind of things that you're able to do. Be so consistent without ever think, thinking that you're heroic. Because I've watched all her interviews, and she says, well, you know, basically, I was doing my thing, you know? I didn't do it for the Greeks. I mean, when you're 50 years old, or, uh, sorry, 100 years old, you've lived through a lot of wars. So she, she never did it for the Greeks, but she did it for her ideal. Our countries, for her, for the Lady of Rome, was an ideal. And she found the energy at 92 to wake up every day after 50 years of doing it and do this little thing of raising our flag and then back down again. So I believe that she was a true esocentric. We think of her as a hero, possibly. But to me, she's somebody that looked inside and said, when everybody left, when all the population left to go to Castellorizo, she looked inside and she found the strength, even when her mother died, when her husband died, to say, no, I will stay here and I will do my thing. And that's okay. So, I want to invite you today to look inside of yourself, to spend those 10 minutes every day to find out who you are, what makes you tick, what it is 
of great that you have, that you can put out there. How will you build your character? And to find your ideals and raise your flag. And I know it takes courage, but please, I do beg you, dare to raise your flag, dare to live by your beliefs, dare to be an esocentric. Thank you.